Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Wister. I'm the chair of the gerontology department at Simon Fraser University, and I'd like to welcome you to the 21st annual John Friesen Lecture Series. Uh, this year we're calling it a conference because we have a collaboration with IRRP, and uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you the speaker for tonight's public lecture. Kim Carter is the Ombudsperson for the province of British Columbia. Uh, Kim has a broad background in criminal, international, and in administrative law. I understand she got her law degree from Osgood, uh, and I had the pleasure of having dinner with her and learned a few things about her, not all of which I'll reveal to you tonight. <laughs> She, she, has appeared, she has appeared as a counsel before the Federal Court of Canada, uh, the Court Martial Appeal Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, very impressive um, bio, by the way. She's worked in Canada and overseas in many capacities, including as leader of the Canadian War Crimes Investigation Team, responsible for conducting on-site war crimes investigations in the former Republic of Yugoslavia for the United Nations in 1993. She served as a member of the Canadian Forces Reserves from 1975 to 1981 as a logistics officer. After her call to the bar in Ontario, she transferred to the regular force as a legal officer. She was the Director of International Law for the Canadian Forces from 91 to 95 and acted as Senior Canadian Forces Counsel during the Somalia Commission of Inquiry. In 1999, then Colonel Carter, she was appointed the first independent director of military prosecutions for the Canadian Forces. From 2002 to 2006, she served as the first female chief military judge. And in 2006, she began a six-year term as ombudsperson for British Columbia. I give you Kim Carter. Thank you very much. Um, I've been told I should speak from here, um, but unfortunately, due to technology differences, I can't actually move my slides forward um, from here. So I will have to ask um, Dr. Gutman for her able assistance. Um, she seems to have organized everything else, so I'm sure she'll keep me on track here. So um, many thanks to uh, the Gerontology Research Center and uh, Dr. Wister and Dr. Gutton for the invitation uh, to uh, present today. Um, I did leave um, some copies of some of our reports relating to seniors care on the back table. Uh, I do see that most of them have disappeared now, so I'm assuming that uh, members of the audience um, have them. So. Um, what I've been asked to do is speak for a period of time and then take questions for an equal period of time, which I'm happy to do. And so um, you'll just have to live with me saying next slide on a rather continual basis, which wasn't part of my original text, but is now worked in. So could I have the next slide, please? Before I talk about the work we've done on seniors, I thought it would be um, important to give you some idea about the role of our office and uh, what we have jurisdiction over. So for the Ombudsperson Office, we've been around since 1979, and we have jurisdiction over a wide range of public and publicly regulated bodies, as you can see here. Ministries, Crown corporations, local government, health authorities, colleges and universities, even self-regulated professions and associations. And so the work we've done on seniors' care has tended to focus on one ministry, the Ministry of Health, and the five regional health authorities. Also, our role is to ensure that people are treated fairly and reasonably by provincial public authorities. Next slide, please. So the office of the ombudsperson is an office of the legislature. We are independent and impartial. We are consultative and resolution oriented in trying to resolve complaints. And issues come to us when individuals bring complaints about public authorities. We do about 8,000 inquiries and complaints a year, 
2,000 individual investigations and early resolutions, and one to two systemic investigations. And so the reports that you have in front of you are, are systemic investigations. And since 2009, we've issued four reports that are related to various aspects of seniors' care. That has been our focus. Next slide, please. So maybe I can talk a little bit, oh sorry, next slide. A little bit about the background to um, these investigations. And it really is an investigation into home and community care services to seniors. That's the focus. And we began it in 2008 for a variety of reasons. We received complaints from some people about home and community care, but not very many. And in part, that was because a number of people didn't realize they could come to our office if they had tried to work out um, an issue with the health authorities and been unsuccessful. In addition, I do tours of the province. We have our office located in Victoria, but I go out to different parts of the province two or three times a year. And I do that and bring members of my staff with me, and we set up the ombudsperson office for the day in communities that range from Masset in uh, the Haida Gwaii, Queen Charlotte's, through to Fernie and um, Nelson, and even we spent half a day in Caslow, so you can see all across the province. Um, my staff um, actually take complaints, and I tend to visit groups, authorities and other groups, and in a tour I was doing in 2008, um, one of the groups that I visited was a group of seniors in Prince George. Very nice people. Um, they had me, they said, come for lunch. So I came for lunch and they said, it's potluck and we've all eaten. So you have to have uh, lunch with us and since we've cooked it, you have to try everything. So they gave me a big plate of stuff to eat and I said, well, I'm here. They said, no, 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 you eat, we'll talk to you. So, um, <clears throat> so they, then insisted I have dessert as well. And uh, I listened. And they had issues. They were dealing with um, concerns with home and community care themselves. They had friends who were dealing with it. And one of the points they made and that very much resonated with me was they said, you know, in a number of cases, we managed to get things worked out because we're a pretty uh, well-organized group. and." It's not so much the people who've got family and friends, it's those who don't have family and friends to work it out that we're concerned about. And we think you should be doing something about that. That was combined with um, some concerns about lack of information and um, some closures on short notice of residential care facilities. So we began an investigation in 2008. Next slide, please. And I'll just tell you a little bit about our investigative process because I realize that I'm talking um, potentially to a mixed group, people who are interested in um, gerontology, people who are interested in um, public policy, and people who are interested in research. Um, as I said to my husband, uh, I'm not a researcher. My experience with public policy is limited to situations where the government is acting in a crisis situation. Now, you may say that's how all public policy is developed, but um, I'm, I hold out hopes that's not the case. And um, in terms of gerontology, I said, well, I'm not an expert in that either. My husband said, well, you're a lot closer to being an expert on it now than you were before. And um, you better be nice to them because they probably know what's going to happen to you better than you do. But I thought I would talk about our investigative process so you understand where we derived our information from. So um, most of our information comes from complaints from individuals and our investigations into those complaints. But in this case, because we knew there were a large number of people who wanted to talk to us but didn't necessarily have a complaint they wanted resolved, so it might be in something that related to a family member who had been in residential care and had perhaps passed on, um, if the only way they could come to us was to complain about what happened, there was probably very little we could do to resolve it, and they weren't looking for that. So we had a questionnaire. We had over 600 people who 
um, completed those questionnaires. We met with, with various authorities, the health authorities, the ministry. We've met with a large group of people and different groups who wanted to talk to us. And in our office, there has never been a systemic investigation that has generated as much response and interest from the public as this one. The issue of seniors' care and home and community care for seniors, we found was something that was of vital interest to a large range of people. And everybody from the unions who represented the care workers through to um, associations of operators, various um, uh, universities and colleges who had programs. We also visited sites. So we went to fifth, more than 50 care facilities, assisted living and residential care across the province in all the health authorities to actually see how things worked. And that was indispensable because you learn things that way that you don't learn any other way. So if you see a picture in a brochure of a bright, shiny kitchen in a residential care facility, you would think it was used to cook the food. But if you visit, you may find that the kitchen isn't used, and in fact the food is frozen somewhere else and brought in and reheated. And so it really is important to go and see facilities. Um, you may see pictures of rooms in some facilities, one room, one person, a bathroom attached. But you may also find out that there are older facilities where there are still two, four people or more sharing a room and sharing a bathroom. So we began, and if I can have the next slide, please, with the first of our reports. And this was the best of care part one. And we focused on seniors care. This came out in, and the aspect of seniors care that we looked at there was only residential care. And we did that because we quickly determined that that was where the most frail and vulnerable seniors were located. And we identified what we saw as three areas where from an administrative fairness point of view, which is what we operate under, um, necessary changes and improvements could be made. The first one was essentially a bill of rights and establishing rights of seniors. Because we heard complaints from people who said, I don't know, you know, I don't even know if I can complain. They say, you know, if you've got a problem, complain, but I don't know what I'm entitled to. What are my rights as a senior in residential care? And when we were putting it together in doing our research, we found out that the province had taken the time to give um, taxi riders in the greater Vancouver area their own bill of rights. And we thought if they had done that, that they could perhaps manage to do a bill of rights for seniors in residential care, arguably a more needy group. And um, as it happened, the minister uh, the person who was the Minister of Health at that time had been a Minister of Transport when the Taxi Riders Bill of Rights went through. So he actually said, ah, oh, yes, that rings a bell. So happily, that was put in place, and that um, is in effect now. And it's really important for about 30% of the seniors in residential care, because in British Columbia, there are two pieces of legislation that apply to residential care. You're either in a residential care facility under the um, Community Care and Assisted Living Act or you're un in one under the Hospital Act. 30% of facilities are under the Hospital Act and there are very, very few rights there. So this has at least made sure that those 30% of people have the same basic rights as everyone else. Second issue we found was a real lack of access to useful information about residential care facilities. And so for um, people who were being asked to make difficult decisions on very tight timelines in emotional circumstances about where spouses or parents were going to be having to move to, and often it was having to move to, um, they could not come back home uh, decisions were being asked for in 24 hours and being ready to move in 48. So this was not something that was a, you had lots of time to go around and look at things. 
there was a real lack of information. And we knew and, um, that California and Ontario both had a system in which there was essentially a website you could go to and you could look up the information you needed. You could say, I'm looking for residential care facilities in this area. Um, I'm looking for them that have certain um, types of care, dementia care, um, some that have certain um, cultural affiliations or religious affiliations, and you would get you know, kind of a list with comparisons. So we knew it could be done. It wasn't impossible. And during um, the time we were doing this, one of our um, team members was actually buying a car. And he came in really excited one morning. And he said, you know, last night I was looking for a car and I can go online and I can say, okay, where are all the dealers in the greater Victoria area? Um, which of them have this model that I'm looking for on the lot? And what are the options? And by gosh, it gives me a comparison. So we knew not only could you do it publicly for um, a service, but the private enterprise was doing it quite handily for other things. So it wasn't impossible. So we recommended that. Unfortunately, I have to say, it wasn't accepted. But on the other hand, there has been a really significant increase in the amount of information that is now on health authority websites. So it has produced some results. And the final issue that we dealt with there was the role of resident and family councils. One of the things that certainly people had been saying to us and one of the things we noticed in our trips um, was that a residential care facility isn't sort of a chronic care hospital. It's not a hospital, it's people's home, often their last home in British Columbia. And the things that are important, perhaps things like smelling cookies baking to make it feel like home, um, you know, having people around you um, and family members having access to you and having your own things to, um, to support you. It's all designed to try and make it a home-like uh, um, experience. And one of the things that's critical are family councils. They are resident and family councils give a voice to residents. Um, they uh, they um, allow families to speak up about issues. And we found they were not being adequately promoted or supported. And we made recommendations there. Again, um, unfortunately not yet implemented, but there have been some positive changes to provide greater recognition of the important role of family councils. Next slide, please. And the following, sorry. So two other reports that came out on February 14th um, that related to seniors care, I will mention very briefly. The first one is on short notice and it was um, an investigation we did of the process that was followed by the Vancouver Island Health Authority when they closed a residential care facility in a small town, Duncan. And um, we found uh, that process was flawed. We found that insufficient information uh, was provided to residents and their families. And there was not appropriate flexibility in making moves. Um, people found out in some cases through the media that they were, as they would say, being evicted. And um, they were while they were originally told they would have priority at nearby residential care facilities, as time went by, the timeline seemed to drive where they were gonna end up more than their well-being. So we uh, made some findings and recommendations and the vast majority of them uh, were accepted. The one that wasn't was that we found that there was um, essentially uh, an Im unfortunate situation when the medical health officer who worked for the health authority was being the one being asked to make the decision as to whether the health authority could be exempted from certain rules. 
because after all it was the health authority asking the medical health officer who was part of their organization whether they could do something. And it was hard to convince people, understandably, that the medical health officer was in a position to say anything other than, yes, you can. So that's the one recommendation that hasn't been accepted, but we've repeated it on a broader basis in our longer report. Next slide, please. The other shorter report, and there were copies of both of them at the back, was called Honoring Commitments. It related to Fraser Health Authority. And Fraser Health Authority was funding on a temporary basis a number of residential care beds in a facility called Newton Regency. Um, they had decided, that is Fraser Health, as a result of some controversy, that they would give the seniors who were in that facility a letter that told the seniors, you can stay here as long as you want, provided this facility is still operating, because that was what the, what the seniors were asking for. So they did that um, in one year, uh, May of one year, and then in June of the next year, they came back and said, whoops, sorry, funding changes, you have to move by September, and then proceeded to make that happen. Um, of the 37 people who were affected by this, three families came to our office. We investigated their complaints. We were able to um, assist them by getting them some more flexibility, both in terms of time and where their choice of moving was. But we also continued to investigate generally the process and made a number of findings and recommendations to the health authority, which they've now accepted. Um, the first one was that they apologized to people for making a promise to them and then very shortly thereafter uh, breaking the promise. But there are also some other um, policy changes that have been made that say that the health authority will now give people more advance warning and be more flexible about uh, the time frames that they're looking for people to move in. Next slide, please. But the really big report, the 448-page one uh, that you should never, ever drop on your foot because it's quite dangerous, um, is the Best of Care Part 2. And this was issued actually on Valentine's Day this year, February 14th. It has 143 findings, and it has 176 recommendations. And rather than go through absolutely everything, what I'm going to do is try and focus on some overarching issues we investigated and some themes that come out of the report, and then just talk to you about some of the issues which I hope you'll be interested in. So when we looked at it, we found that from an administrative fairness point of view, there were some real issues. Questions about the adequacy of information people had available to them when they were being asked to make decisions about where they or family members were going to live. Uh, questions about the accessibility of the services. For example, after you've been assessed as qualifying, um, how long do you have to wait? Standards of care. Are there standards of care? What are they? Um, complaints processes and how adequate they were. Monitoring and enforcement. I'll mention it later, but um, we found that many inspections were being done really only within normal working hours and after being announced. And that doesn't necessarily give you a full and complete picture as to what's happening. And we did some more work on the facility closure issue. Next slide, please. So you will not be surprised, perhaps, to find that um, some of these themes came out of what we looked at. The need for more useful and accessible information. We found, unfortunately, there's a need to have assistance in navigating the system. I wish it wasn't the case. It was a simple, straightforward, easily handled system, but it's not. And when you combine that with the challenging circumstances people are in in having to make decisions, there's assistance required. Supporting those who deliver care, clear, objective, and enforceable standards of care, 
we found were lacking. Um, we made recommendations to have more straightforward and responsive complaints processes. It's all very well having a complaints process, but if you can't get an answer back as to what happened as a result of your complaint, it's not really a very responsive process. And a renewed commitment on focusing on the needs of seniors and listening to their concerns and respecting their choices. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of some complaints that came to us, just to give you a taste of the kind of things that we investigate and did investigate individually and continue to do so in some cases. So next slide, please. So this is a lady who came to us and it was a home support scenario. Her mother was receiving home support and all of a sudden her hours of home support were cut in half. And her daughter came to us. Um, well, originally she went to the health authority and said, I don't understand, my mum's needs haven't changed, so why are her home support hours changing? And they said, well, you know, we've assessed it and they don't really need, it doesn't really require that much time to do what's necessary. And if you want more support, you're gonna have to go and pay for it privately. So the daughter tried to work it out with the health authority, was unsuccessful, came to our office. We investigated, and in the course of the investigation, the health authority had another look at the situation, and they said, oh, gosh, you know, we didn't realize that we were having and had agreed to provide that as home support and that as home support. And so perhaps not entirely surprisingly, it turned out since the seniors' needs hadn't changed and since you know, the home support worker wasn't drinking a lot of coffee and could do it really, really quickly, um, the amount of time that was required was still pretty much the same, and those were restored. Next slide, please. And this is um, another um, situation, and it's one where a lady came to us, not unusual, her stepmother had a stroke, ended up in hospital, could not go home afterwards, and so she was in hospital. Um, there was a, a real interest on everyone's part in moving her out of hospital. And the health authority said, well, the first available bed is in a care facility near UBC. Now, they had some rationale there. This was where the lady's home was when she lived by herself. But all her family was in New Westminster. And the family had said, well, you know, um, since mom is no longer living in her own home, um, a facility close to us would allow us to visit regularly. But um, essentially they were told, no, it's the first available bed. In fact, the rule is it's the first available and appropriate bed that um, you, you have to accept. And um, having your family being able to visit is one of the things that, that needs to be considered in determining appropriateness. So um, again, we investigated because the person um, who was doing this said, well, you can go on the transfer list. Um, what many people don't know, and this is part of the lack of information, is that if you're on a transfer list, um, it may be quite some time before you get a transfer. So happily, um, this did get resolved with the move uh, happening more quickly, but it was still six months on the transfer list. Thank you, next slide. So that gives you a taste, I think, of the individual cases. Um, sometimes people come to, to us and say, oh gosh, you know, you're pretty dispassionate in your language and if you read our reports. I mean, that's our job is to be independent and impartial. It doesn't mean that we're not dealing with highly emotional situations. It's just that our focus has to be on being that independent and impartial voice. So I'm going to talk about home and community care, home support, assisted living, and residential care. And some of what I will put up will be tables and charts. And you may think, why bother? And part of the reason is because a lot of this is information that wasn't readily available to people. A lot of the charts and a lot of the comparative information isn't out there anywhere else. And one of the points that we've made and one of the themes of our report is that this information 
should be out there. It should be publicly available. There should be an annual report to people about home and community care program and what is happening there. So we've kind of done our part by giving an examples in our report. So home and community care generally, there's about 60,000 seniors in any given year who benefit from home and community care in British Columbia. And it's a surprise to some people that it's not all covered under the Canada Health Act. Um, a lot of people think that is the case. As it happens, it isn't. And so there are various charges um, they range, as it says, from $10 to $2,900 in residential care. Um, actually, technically, it could be a little higher in assisted living, but um, for the most part, that's the range that people have to pay. Next slide. So under home and community care, we looked at some issues that crossed um, all levels of support. And one of the ones we looked at was the issue of reporting abuse and neglect. And when we looked at it, there was quite a comparison and a different approach between the requirements for health professionals, those providing care, the obligation on them to report suspicions of abuse and neglect if it was a vulnerable child versus a vulnerable adult. And so although there is some legislative provisions that say people may report it, there's no obligation to do so. And one of the things we looked at is as people who are assessed as being eligible for home and community care have been assessed as having health needs that need to be met, then those health care professionals should be required to report abuse and neglect. And we also added in that they should be required to report uh, if services aren't being delivered because we did have complaints that you know, people's, the services that they were receiving weren't actually the services they were assessed as needing. And in addition, those staff members should be protected if they decide to make those reports because that was also a concern that people um, said, I see things, I'd report it, but I'm scared if I do so that my job's in danger. They might be right, they might not be right, but the fact that they have a fear about it obviously influences their willingness to come forward. And so what we've recommended is that staff and indeed other people who complain about inadequate services and abuse and neglect are protected. And you'll see here um, an extension of protection from financial abuse. For seniors in residential care, if they make very large gifts to their caregivers, um, then that actually has to be approved by a third party, the public guardian and trustee, to make sure that the senior isn't being unduly influenced or taken advantage of. That same provision doesn't exist for assisted living, and surprisingly, it doesn't exist for home support, where seniors are receiving support in their own homes and there be, may be even fewer people around to look at uh, what is going on. So we've made a recommendation <coughs> on that. Next slide, please. So this is just a small um, kind of taste of some of the numbers. And you may ask, why are we putting it in there? Um, in fact, it's because it's an interesting issue and it ties into a very short practical recommendation that we made. One of the things in home and community care and seniors care is um, it, there's almost a disincentive to take action because people say, oh, but it's going to cost millions of dollars to do anything here. And the answer is often that's not the case. You need to focus on a particular area and look at fixing a particular problem. So this was just something that when we looked at it, people would come to us. The amount of money that you have to pay for home support, assisted living, and residential care is determined um, by regulation. And there is, however, a provision that if it causes someone undue hardship, they can apply for what's known as a fee reduction waiver. But people would come to us and say, 
you know, I, I said we couldn't afford this, that my you know, mother was still living at home while my father was in residential care, and if we had to pay 80%, then my mother wouldn't have enough money. But no one told us about this fee waiver process, which perhaps we could have benefited from. And so we asked the health authorities, since there is a policy and an obligation for them to administer it, um, how many they had administered um, over any given year. This is actually um, something that it reflects well on Fraser Health because they at least could answer the question. The other health authorities didn't have that information available. And so it's an, an indication of some information that would be useful to know. And our rationale was that if there were a whole bunch of requests for fee waivers, then really policymakers might benefit from knowing that because perhaps that had um, some influence on whether or not the fee levels were a reasonable fee level or not. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give you some of the shorter term uh, recommendations that um, we dealt with, and I'll start with one that's not up there, but ties into that last set of numbers I gave you. Um, when we went to and thought about this, we said, you know, there's actually a pretty easy way of making sure people who need to know about fee waivers have the information. Because every year, if you're in assisted living or residential care, you'll get a letter from the health authority that tells you what your rate, assessed rate will be starting next January. So every year in the fall, the health authorities go out to everyone and say, next January, this is how much you will have to pay for assisted living or your residential care rate. Well, you could put a piece of paper in that same envelope about fee waivers, and then everybody, perhaps not everyone because some people will come in after that, but a large number of people will know. You can do that. They will be able to think about it at the time they get the figure that they're going to have to pay, and so you know, it will be a connection they'll make. It won't cost any more because you can put it in the same envelope with the same stamp and you can resolve this issue. So I raise that as an example. Not all of our 176 recommendations are that neat and practical, but there are a number like that which are not that hard to address. So these are, whoops, thank you. These are some of the shorter term recommendations very generally that we made. One is to ensure seniors are informed of the availability of services because not everybody knows in fact, the um, Ministry of Health told us that really, as far as they were looking at, more than 60% of seniors weren't even told what was available, even if they could benefit from it. Second one was standardizing registration and training. And interestingly, there is a standard training curriculum for all care aides who are trained in public colleges but if they train in private colleges, it's optional whether the private college follows that curriculum or a different one. And that doesn't make sense if these uh, care aides are all going to be dealing with people in the same, with the same needs and the same background. And the fi final one I've already talked about, which is requiring staff to report abuse or neglect. Um, currently, it's only operators who are required, not staff, and staff are the ones who uh, are often seeing things. Next slide, please. We also made some longer-term re uh, recommendations. I've talked about making information public, um, establishing a program to support and navigate the system, and the protection for um, essentially people who report abuse and neglect. Next slide, please. So let me move on to talking about home support, which is an area of, we found great interest because most seniors want to stay in their homes as long as they can. And so we looked at that. We also looked at the overall aim of the policy, which not surprisingly perhaps declared it to be to keep people, to keep seniors in their homes as long as possible. And we then looked at really how the program worked. And there was a bit of a disconnect between the goal and the process. Next slide, please. 
So here's another one of our tables that may be of interest to you. It's just giving you an idea of the funding um, that's um, in place, each of the health authorities comparatively, um, and the provincial totals. Now, I have to caution you, as in very small letters, incomplete data submissions means some numbers may be understated. Um, a recurring challenge that we had was that health authorities didn't keep necessarily all this information, and so it was not something where they or we could say it's 100% accurate. Um, perhaps more of a problem for them than it was for us. Next slide, please. But our focus on home support was whether or not the program was meeting its goal and seemed to be structured to achieving that. And in fact, we found that there were some problems there. And the problems uh, seem to be both in the eligibility criteria and the services delivered. So we ran into situations where somebody said, if my mother or father could have got a little more support at home, they could have stayed there. But unfortunately, you know, the health authority said they only provide this support, so instead they had to move into residential care. Residential care is a pretty expensive process, not only for the senior, but actually for the taxpayer who's subsidizing the senior. So for example, 150 to $200 a day is the average subsidy rate for residential care. While you would think if you were paid $80 a day or $100 a day to keep somebody in their home, you might still be a little bit ahead of the curve. They would be happier. You would be spending less money. It seemed like an easy equation, but it clearly wasn't. There'd been a number of studies um, done that said um, this was uh, advisable. I think someone who spoke here earlier, Marcus Hollander, has done various studies. There was um, a Premier's Commission on Aging that said the same thing. But obviously, um, the government wasn't convinced. So our recommendation there was the government do the study and then report out to everybody what it found. because. You know, perhaps there's some secret barrier, but if there, you know, if there isn't, um, there needs to be an explanation as to why this isn't happening. And so that's our recommendation, and we added that they should also look at and report out publicly on the costs and benefits of um, expanding the program up to the level of residential care. Because for residential care, in addition to the costs, of course, Every time there's a need for extra residential care beds, somebody has to build an entire facility. It's not just sitting there waiting to be filled. So it's quite a costly process, and home support would seem to be something that was a, a useful alternative. Next slide, please. So here are some of the longer-term recommendations that um, we made under home support. and. The one I would add that I haven't talked about is the clear enforceable standards. There aren't actually any formal regulatory standards. There's a provision in an act that can be used to establish them, but they have never been established for home support. And so it's hard to monitor and enforce standards if you don't have them. It's hard to complain about something if you don't know what the rules are. Next slide, please. Assisted living is, um, I would say for many people, the kind of situation you might envision yourself happily living in. It's usually an individual apartment. There's support in terms of um, meals um, in a dining room in the building. Um, there's usually someone on staff who will help you with things such as housekeeping and, and things like that. So it's certainly a growth area. Um, relatively recent in British Columbia, established as a concept in 2002, operational since 2004, um, mainly um, being provided by uh, private and not-for-profit uh, organizations. And as you can see here, about two-thirds of the units are subsidized and about one third are not subsidized. 
And this is a little um, summary. Um, I think we're in Vancouver Coastal here. So as you can see, um, they have about 816 publicly subsidized units, 393 private pay, where the person pays the full cost of the unit. Next slide. So one of the big issues um, that came to our attention in assisted living was the fact that the people who are in assisted living, particularly subsidized assisted living, have been assessed as needing some support. They have some physical frailty. You know, they need assistance. You might think that they would have at least the same protection as tenants as everyone else. Um, the answer is no, they don't. Um, they don't have any tenancy protection. Um, they can be asked to move almost immediately. We had one case where a lady um, who came to us because her mother was being asked to move in two days because um, the operator felt she wasn't abiding by the rules. There was none of this, you have to have two months notice, you can contest it in front of the residential tenancy board. There was a solution in 2006 in the Tenancy Statutes Amendments Act, but it's never been implemented. And we found out in the course of our investigation, it never will be, um, and the responsibility has moved from housing to health now. But part of our recommendation is to say, people in this situation should have at least the same rights as other tenants, and possibly more rights, given that they're more vulnerable. Next slide, please. Another issue, of course, is how soon after you're assessed as qualifying for assisted living. And when qualifying is a nice way of saying needing, you have to satisfy um, the person, a case manager from the health authority, that you need this. Um, will you move in? And as this indicates, um, on average, it's a little bit of a wait for people. Next slide, please. So, you will see where our first recommendation came from, which is at least to establish a time frame within which eligible, eligible seniors receive subsidized assisted living. Um, you may think, you know, does it matter? There's quite a range of time frames, even between the health authorities. And if you look at it practically speaking, somebody who might be living with say, um, a family member or in, in a particular health authority might actually be willing and interested in moving if they could get into assisted living more quickly somewhere else. So there are some very practical issues, as well as the idea that if we are looking at this as a system, people should know how long are you going to have to wait if you're assessed as needing this. In addition, um, the required compliance with policy on benefits and allowable charges is an interesting issue. When we began our investigation, there wasn't a fixed rule on what was included in the fee that you paid in residential care or assisted living. So for example, people would come and say, well, in my building, I have to pay for this while my friend down the road doesn't have to pay, it's included. Why is that? Um, happily, the ministry um, developed some standard rules on what was included in the fee. Uh, unhappily, after making a policy and sending it out, they then said, but it doesn't have to be enforced until 2013. So having s essentially solved the problem, um, they then didn't put the solution into effect. And so that's our recommendation there. And the other thing is that there needs to be some more reporting. Serious incidents are things such as injuries um, and uh, assaults on people. And although there are some rules, they are, in our view, by no means extensive enough and they need to be expanded. Next slide, please. And I go back to one of our themes, which is the issue of legally binding quality of care standards. The other thing that I think is very important for you to know is that assisted living, the assisted living registrar, we're a small office. Uh, we have about 33 people devoted to ombudsperson activities. 
The assisted living registrar was a really small office. It had actually one person, the assisted living registrar, and then three people on contract um, from another organization to help her. And if you look at the expansion of assisted living facilities, you will find that really there was no expansion of the people who were responsible for registering and although they had limited powers, responsible for responding to complaints from people. So we made some recommendations about that. Next slide, please. Residential care is essentially the um, big money or big ticket item in seniors care for the obvious reason that um, in essence, it costs quite a bit for the health authorities. Uh, in our report, you'll see the comparative table on how much um, each of the health authorities pays, both for private and for publicly um, run facilities. But also, and I mentioned this earlier, is that actually about 70% of the facilities in British Columbia are under one legislative framework and the 30% are under another. And it appears really mainly for historical reasons and because of some limited tax ramifications if there's a change. Next slide, please. For those of you who have a copy of the report, if you're looking for all these tables in that, you actually have the overview. You'll find them in the disk in the front, which is the full report. Um, so I see that some people were looking interestedly. Um, this is a number of publicly subsidized residential care beds. These are the numbers that um, we could obtain. I have to say the Ministry of Health numbers didn't always um, match with the health authority numbers. In fact, there was um, some argument that we shouldn't take the health authority numbers because they weren't the right numbers. Um, our view was that if there was a difference, we took the health authority numbers because they were closer to delivering the services, so they were more likely to be accurate. I think the thing you would see here and you would recognize is there hasn't been a dramatic increase in the number of residential care beds. There hasn't been a dramatic increase in a number of areas, and that's actually very interesting because seniors are the largest growing sector of our population, and in particular, seniors over 85 are the fastest growing, um, and you, it's something we had thought we would see would be a much greater increase in the number of um, residential care beds. Yes, thank you. And this is another number that will be of interest to you. This is the number of people waiting for placement in subsidized residential care um, on, at three time periods. So if you will remember, we have about 26,000 residential care beds and at any point in time about uh, between 12 and 1,800 people waiting to get in. Thank you. And the final little piece of information, of course, is, and if you are waiting, how long do you have to wait? Um, and this is, we looked at the shortest, longest, and the average to um, assess this. Next slide, please. So, we looked at a series of issues, and one of the ones is one that I mentioned already with um, the little vignette that I discussed, which is when you're looking at residential care, when you're offered uh, a placement in a residential care facility, um, what happens? And the policy in British Columbia is something called the first available and appropriate bed policy. It's now been renamed a little, but throughout our investigation, it was this, and the principles still remain the same. Um, for many people, they're always told about first available. They're not told that it has to be appropriate to them. And you can understand why. The health authorities are struggling to you know, move people out of hospital beds into residential care or provide support to people in the community who can't be 
uh, assisted there. So when a bed comes up, um, they're already paying for it on contract. They'd like to put somebody who can benefit from it in the bed. Um, at the same time, if you're on the other end as the senior, um, you're asked to sign. In order to qualify for a bed, you have to have the requisite physical um, frailty or cognitive impairment. And interestingly, since it's a cognitive impairment, you also have to sign <laughs> to um, agree to accept a bed within 24 hours, move within 48 hours, and pay the fees that are going to be assessed to you over and above um, you know, what, what the standard fee is, um, which is really, really difficult to do. I mean, it's not, very, it's not very informed consent to moving in when you don't know all this. So um, one of the things that we said is you should remove that requirement that you agree to anything in order to be eligible, because really the basis for eligibility is you have a need. You meet the medical health requirements of needing this. It shouldn't be dependent on whether or not uh, you sign. And there needs to be some more flexibility in moving in. Not in every case, but in some cases. The other thing is, in some health authorities, um, people were told if they didn't accept the first available bed or the second one that they were offered, um, their name would be removed. They'd be struck off the list. Well. You know, that was quite strange because the way you got on the list was you were not well, you were sick, you had medical needs. Well, if they struck you off the list, then you'd, they'd have to reassess you. And presumably, unless you'd had a miraculous recovery, you'd go right back on the list pretty much where you came off the list. So it seemed to be pretty useless from an administrative point of view other than perhaps persuading people that they wanted to accept something that they really didn't want to accept. So we recommended that uh, they cease and desist that. And the final thing that you may find interesting is that there were special rules. In fact, as far as I know, there still are special rules that apply, which people aren't always told about. So we had complaints and concerns from people who had a family member in hospital, and they found out that they family member needed residential care, but they were going to have to wait to get it because they couldn't get an immediate placement. Um, and in fact, they were going to have to wait in hospital or in some other uh, situation that the family didn't feel comfortable with. So the family would say, "Okay, well, you know, we can't really afford it, but we we'll, we can move mum in for about three. How long? It's three or four months. We'll move her in for three or four months into this." facility and then hopefully she'll get transferred in she should you know the list is should be off the list then what they didn't realize was the assessment is based on not only your need but whether or not it's being met so once you placed someone in privately paid facility then the need dropped the, you dropped off you know right down the list because the need was being met so we had one gentleman who, who did this for his wife, and it was 18 months before she got transferred because mm -hmm. there were always people in front of her, and you know he was trying to make it work to keep her in the facility. So we was, we've said, you know, very simple actually, tell people about this because they might make different arrangements. Grandchildren might come and live with them for a period of time rather than putting them in to a residential care. But don't tell them, you know, you're, it's three or four months, and then not tell them they're going to drop down the list if they do this. Next slide, please. Um, this is something that um, may be of interest to you. It's really um, something that relates to the daily hours of direct care provided per resident. Um, there isn't any legislative requirement for a minimum number in British Columbia. Um, but these are the numbers comparatively in the different health authorities um, in two uh, different years. Um, the ministry has said that it would like to th see 3.31 hours um, by 2013-14, but um, the plans that the health authorities have 
um, to do achieve that um, don't have any of them achieving it except one who's going to drop their hours to um, to get to that level. Um, and the health authority said, unless we have more funding, we're not going to be meeting your goal. And it's certainly just a goal. It's not an obligation. Next slide, please. So another area, as I said, um, that was a focus was the difference in um, Hospital Act and Community Care and Assisted Living Act facilities. There are differences in many, many areas in terms of when incidents uh, have to be reported, uh, whether or not um, there's a certain number of people who can be in rooms, food, inspections, restraints, difference in charges and benefits. And our recommendation was that there be essentially one system for everyone because you don't know when you're offered, whether you're going into a Community Care and Assisted Living Act, Hospital Act regulated facility, no one says, which one would you like? Um, so there doesn't appear to be any rationale for having two different systems with all these differences. And the senior, in the end, uh, doesn't really have the choice of saying, oh, I like this system, or I don't like this system. And frankly, given that everybody is being provided, or should be provided the same level of care, it doesn't make sense not to have the same rules. So that's our, one of our recommendations. So I'm going to um, end with just a little bit about our shorter term recommendations. I do have some information after that on the slides about um, what recommendations have been accepted, how it's being implemented, but I think I'll leave that to question period. So on the shorter, oh, sorry, this is the extra charges. Um, what I will say about extra charges is, as you can tell from this, there's quite a bit of difference as to who's getting charged what. And um, what we have said is that there should be some standard rules. And in addition, residents should only be paying what they're required to pay, which is accommodation costs. Um, Interestingly, they're not always separated out from other costs. Accommodation is room and board. Um, the other th interesting thing for some people would be that um, for some seniors, there's about 100 of them in British Columbia, they, if they're involuntarily detained under the Mental Health Act, which is a pretty extreme process, um, they can be released into the community but in some cases, they are released only into the community into a residential care facility, and then they are charged for staying in the residential care facility. So you have the um, unusual situation of someone being involuntarily detained against their will and then being charged for that. Next slide, please. So here are some of our shorter-term recommendations. You will not be surprised to know that what we did was recommend that that involuntary patients should not be charged um, for that. And we have a focus on giving seniors more choice and a little more flexibility in this area. Next slide, please. And these are some of the longer term recommendations. And again, I will highlight for you the focus that we have on establishing clear enforceable standards so that those can be monitored and there can be reports made out about them and people know what they're entitled to and what they can complain about. I'll leave you with one um, thought. If you're in jail in British Columbia, you are entitled to at least one bath a week. If you are in residential care, you have no such entitlement. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you and I'd be happy to deal with any questions that you have. Thank you. Questions. So, I'll, you know, if you ha if you have questions, I'm happy to have them. If you don't, I'm happy to uh, give you some idea of 
some of the things that have happened since the report. I'd like to ask a question, and first of all, I just want to thank Kim for, for an extremely informative presentation. And what's striking is the amount of, of work that went into this. Uh, I mean, Gloria, you and I have been around here for a long time, and I don't think there's ever been this kind of a report from the Ombudsman's office. So one question I have is, how did you get this done? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think you will recognize um, it's the usual way. You set an impossible goal and um, you give it to really good people and um, they work extremely hard to get it done. It's a very small team who's done this. Um, I have played a role, my executive director has played a role. Um, there was a manager and two investigators. And then we, had, we have um, uh, a number of co-op students, um, mm. law and public admin, who we rotate through. Um, so there are about, if you look at the beginning of the report, right. um, you'll see a number of names of other contributors. The vast majority of them are other co-op students. So there's a whole bunch of people in their early 20s who are running around, not only BC but Canada, with far more knowledge and interest in seniors' um, care than, uh, than you would expect. Um, and we relied very heavily on them. They would come in and say, oh, you give us such interesting stuff to do. And we didn't say that's because we're desperate because we have <laughs> no, other, no other way of doing this. Um, so it, what I would say is it was a lot of work. Um, sometime about mid-January, we were all going down for the third time. But ultimately, our aim was to get it out before we all became seniors ourselves, <laughs> and we managed to do that. So I thank you. It's the longest report we've ever done. It's the most comprehensive report it we've is. ever done. And I think it's because this is an area that really warrants attention right now. I think, from my perspective, there's a real opportunity to make some positive changes, and I hope that our office contributes to that. And, and a second question is, uh, which of these recommendations do you think are, are being acted on or will be acted upon by the government okay. or, um, or related institutions? <laughs> yes, there's probably um, a difference. Um, as you can see here, um, this, this wasn't re these weren't really necessarily our recommendations, but the government did put out an action plan the same day as our report was made public and um, with a number of um, promises. So um, these are kind of practical things that um, they have done. Um, and so probably about 16 or 20 of the recommendations have been implemented, mainly ones to individual health authorities um, and a couple to the ministry. One was that the ministry put out its uh, a report that it was doing on the increased use of antipsychotic medication in residential care because there was significant concern that um, there was a spike in the use of antipsychotics and you know people's people's concerns were whether or not these were medically um, required or whether they were more to facilitate um, effective administration of a, a large number of, of people. Um, we've made actually a series of recommendations about the pro um, uh, use of um, antipsychotics and other medications to make sure there's proper consent for the use of medications and it's, it's properly monitored. Um, but that re report came out and also a little report on health authority investment of revised residential care client rate revenue. It might not seem like a particularly you know, catchy title, but there were um, some, there was an overhaul in January 2010 of residential care rates and um, the rationale for it was that all the extra money that was being paid by the client, i.e. the seniors, would be going to direct care. That was what people were told. But when we were investigating and we, we looked at the health authorities' plans for using the money, um, it wasn't all going to increase direct care for the seniors. And so um, our recommendation was to put out a report. They have put out a report. I would say that it perhaps defines direct care in a little more liberal fashion than, um, 
than the normal usage of that. But I think it is important because it does tell people what's happening with that money, which is you know money that was destined towards direct care for individuals. Okay. Um, there have been some enhancements to information. Um, and this, this wording is taken from the action plan. Um, we had 448 pages. The action plan, if you take off the introduction and the two pages at the end that talk about what's, what has already happened is about 11 pages. So it's not a direct um, uh, response. But um, these are some of the things. And I have just because knowing the audience is research public policy interest, I have done a little analysis. So can you go to the next um, standards and quality management in the next slide? There's one that's got a comp So this was, I thought I would take some of our recommendations and the response and compare them for you. So. Um, we had a series of recommendations about um, the whole issue of the Community Care and Assisted Living Act and the Hospital Act and the differences between the two and making sure that, um, in fact, people were not being unfairly treated by ending up under a different system. So um, you can see that that was our recommendation. We also recommended there shouldn't be any reduction in benefits to seniors as you went through this harmonization. And another thing, um, we had gone into the report thinking that there would be some objective analysis of whether or not the budget that was assigned was actually sufficient to meet the needs um, that had been assessed, and we found out that that didn't actually exist, and we thought it would probably be a really good start point to that public information that could go out there. Could you go to the next slide? And um, there were some historical funding anomalies, which I can talk about if you're interested, but we said they should be addressed. Um, developing a process for accurately calculating cost of accommodation and service, reviewing fees, etc. The response that I found is essentially that one. Standardize benefits and protections to all residential care clients by January 2013. So if you ask me what I think will happen, um, I would say the action plan is the most likely to happen, though some of the things in there are supposed to have been happened by April of 2012, and um, whether or not that is happening, I, I will leave to, to people to determine. Um, but um, whether that response actually does include all those issues or not, um, I, I don't know at this stage. I think that um, there will be some standardization that comes out. I very much hope that there, there will be a lot more public reporting. Um, I think that's vitally important. People need to know what the standards are, um, what the wait times are, what the rules are, and the only way you can do that is by consistent, regular, comparative, accurate reporting that goes out to everybody. And then you can have a good conversation, and it's not um, the passion and your ideological basis that you're, you're using, it's people talking from facts that everyone has access to, and I think it makes for a much better understanding of the where the programs really are and a much better basis for improving them because you can say, but why does it take so long for this if you know how long it's taking? But if you don't have that information, then you know it may be that somebody with good or bad intent says, well, you know, that's just an isolated case. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but if there's good reporting, you'll know whether it's an isolated case or a uh, problem for the system. So I'm hopeful for information. I'm hopeful for some standardization. Um, I know the standards are going to be a challenge, but I, I'm hopeful that there will be at least some clear objective standards. 
Um, I understand the attraction of outcome-based measurement, which is what's currently used, but I think we all know that you know uh, there can be a dearth of regulations, there can be too many regulations. We've seen areas recently where you know, the regulations were a little short, uh, the financial area, and it didn't all work out that happily. So I think a good mixture of um, regulations um, at, with some flexibility, and I'll give you an example um, of that, the bathing issue that I raised. Um, a number of people said to us, well, a number of seniors have, you know, very delicate skin, and in fact, they shouldn't be bathed that often said, well, okay, how about this? You could have something that says they're entitled to it unless it's medically noted mm -hmm. on their file that they shouldn't have it. And that way they have a right, there is a standard, but it's reasonably adapted to their individual circumstances as opposed to no one has this standard applied to them um, because it could be that everyone has really delicate skin. So that would be, those would be the areas, I hope. Are there other questions? Show me. <laughs> Stand up a little bit taller. Again, thank you for such a great wealth of information. Um, I was noticing you um, under the government response, one was the seniors advocate, and I was wondering if that would, came specifically out of a recommendation from the report itself, or, or was it just a general government reaction? Yeah. The answer is no, it didn't come specifically from the report. Our recommendation was worded that, that, that people needed assistance navigating the home and community care system. We didn't say how. Um, I think it's fair to say the seniors advocate was something that was being spoken about by a number of other different groups. And so we have never claimed um, that as, as ours. It has been attached because I think the government response, because of it coming out at the same time, sort of attached it. Um, with that, the important thing for people to know is that the government is currently um, looking at how that should be structured and um, consulting. So if people have views, um, then now is the time to tell government about it because they said four to six months. <coughs> so that should be, you know, between mid-June and mid-August is the time frame they're looking at who the senior advocates, um, really who they should be, what the role of the office should be, what the status, um, how large, etc. And so if people want to put input in, now's the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's one of those, those kinds of, a, of approaches that it has kind of a, uh, you know, an appeal to people, but when you start thinking about it, that it ends up becoming a place where just sort of all the problems kind of get shunted. And, and with with few resources to be able to you know <laughs> to actually address um, it, the issues either at an individual level or at a system wide type of level, so it's it's always a big concern what that actually looks like. The only thing I always say is whatever the role is, ensure that the resources match the yeah. role. Yeah, um, that's really critical. So how it will develop, I'm not sure. I've heard various um, descriptions, everything from someone to be an advocate for seniors in home and community care scenarios through to an office of the legislature who will um, advocate for all seniors in every situation, whether it be their homeowner's grant or their driver's license or something else. So I don't actually know, but I do know that the ministry is looking at it and if you have views, now's the time to share them. Thank you. Yeah, because what the ministry said at, uh, at the time that the minister made the announcement was that it would be someone who would look at people who otherwise would fall between the cracks. So it, it, it uh, was not just the, you know, the, the, the grand scheme of things, but rather that they, they had in mind something more specific. I think we have right behind you. Oh, 
Thank you very much. It's been very, very interesting. I've been reading your reports um, with great interest out in White Rock. And um, I had a question in your part one report. There was a, a quite a large section on resident councils and the resident's yes. voice in long-term care. And in part two, that seemed to not disappear, but I was just kind of wondering what, like where that's gone and, um, and also, if if we're linking a little bit, the um, Ontario, for example, has the Association of Resident Councils, a very active, strong. They're part of the task force with the abuse issues that are going on right now in Ontario. So I was wondering if if that is being looked at, or is it? Um well, what I would say is, our part two, we didn't repeat what we said in part one. Those are right. still outstanding ah, from okay. our perspective. Okay. Um, with the resident and family councils, um, you know, essentially the, the response to part one of the report was, we accept all the recommendations or the intent of the recommendations, but we'll do them a different way. And one of the things that we had said with resident and family councils is, you need to give them someone they can talk to at the health authority and the ministry level because they're a great resource for you. They're the people who are going in every single day to uh, residential care facilities. So, you know, if you're saying as health authorities were, well, we only have so many inspectors and so much, here you've got people who are going in responsibly if a family council comes to you and says there's a problem of this nature, you should want to hear because you should want to resolve problems before they become crises. That's what we see it. In part, that's what our office does. I mean, we're doing this before there's a crisis um, rather than after um, because crises are a great way to get attention except for the people who've actually suffered the crises, and that's pretty awful for them. Yeah. So, um, as I said, I, I have done um, kind of crisis policy management at the federal level, I hasten to add. I'm not su su casting any aspersions on the provincial level. Um, and, um, you know, Having a crisis and then solving it, well, everyone who solves a crisis, you know, gets lots of kudos, but boy, the people who help avoid the crisis, they may not get all the recognition, but what a satisfaction that, you know, there aren't hurt people around because you fixed it before it happened. Yeah. So with the resident family councils, um, we've certainly um, uh, worked to try and make sure that they uh, have as much of a role as possible because we see them as valuable not only to um, the people who are in the facility, and for example, if you don't have a family member who's visiting regularly, the family council may speak up for you, um, but also we actually think they help the system because um, they help the ministry and they can help the health authorities and the facility provide the services that they indicate they wish to. Um, we're just still working on the convincing bit. So as far as you know, there is no, there, um, there may be a follow-up going on, but we don't have anything in writing. And um, What I would say is there has been uh, some policy direction gone out that, that says that the facilities have to provide more support to family and resident councils, so that has been progress, but it's not quite as extensive as we recommended. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you again for coming and talking with us. And I was there at Kamloops to, to, to listen to you. Kamloops. Ah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, th that thing on the screen, the, the response and the recommendations is something new. Yes. Well, it's and something new I put together. Yeah. I don't is, it, yeah. is it available from your office if we wanted to have the copies of that? Well, um, what I would say is of, of these particular slides, um, I provided them to the university so you can have uh, yeah. copies of they all of them. On our website. I think they made me sign away my entire life in terms of disclaimers and ability to publish. Uh, at least they tried to. I yeah. put a line because through, through things. In fact, I asked your office about three weeks ago, and they've been very helpful, and they did uh, tell me that they're, they're, they're being prepared. Well, and the answer is they're being done one by one. So I did this Monday evening in oh. my office personally. 
Okay. Um, and so it hasn't been done fully for all of them yet. But because this was a group of um, people interested in public policy, um, I did it with one of them just to give an example. And you're certainly welcome to the example. And once we have a chance to uh, do more, then I do know about the request to Carly Hyman, and we will uh, get it out to the people who've asked. Thank you. Now, the, of course, uh, the action plan by the government, the 12 pages of whatever, I think you're being very generous. Uh, beside the front page and the two last pages, there are also pictures of happy looking seniors taken from the archives. And if you take that out. And there's mean, also stories, little vignette stories of examples, yes. I agree, in, in those pages, yes. But the last thing I wanted to ask you was uh, I understand the government has now on their website a 14 pages discussion paper or consultation paper on the senior advocate. I only got to know about it this morning. Uh, in fact, um, since I've been on the road since yesterday, I wasn't aware, so thank you. I'll check it out. Well, I, I was going to ask you, you're going to comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my comment is they didn't send it to me first, as you can tell, and uh, I will certainly have a look at it. Um, I'm... Um, I think I have a meeting in a couple of weeks where the, the ministry wants to tell me what they're doing, but perhaps they've got ahead of themselves. Well, in case then there's something new, they have 10 meetings scheduled in the whole of BC, two of them in Vancouver, I think it's 4th or 5th January, sorry, June, one in Surrey, I can't remember the dates, one in Abbotsford, and then there's some in the, one in Victoria, some in the interior, they're only total 10, and they are having these consultations, which means they are only talking to people who will be invited, depending on who has uh, registered with them. And then they've asked for written submissions to be sent to them by 31st July. I that's, see. Okay. That's a written submission. Thank, Thank you very much.